ever since explosive weapons were uh, developed uh, more than 150 years ago, virtually with the invention of dynamite, uh, the explosives that were produced and used on battlefields remained afterwards. And in most cases, they remained and were simply the problem of the local community to deal with. And uh, if we look at the conflicts in the last 40 or 50 years, these local communities are mainly in the poorest countries on earth. And so over a hundred, more than 100 years, uh, and now over recent decades where more and more explosive force could be used and delivered in huge quantities over long distances in armed conflicts, we had a situation where basically the problem was left to the local community to deal with as best they could. When the military left, it was somebody else's problem. It wasn't the international community's problem. It was just the poorest communities on earth, usually, to deal with. And they did it, of course, but at great cost to lives and limbs and livelihoods. In 2003, the international community adopted, by consensus, Protocol 5 on Explosive Remnants of War of the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons. As a state party to this convention, the Republic of Hungary decided to host a workshop focusing on explosive ordnance disposal. More than 15 countries sent experts to Budapest to take part in this exercise. The Hungarian Defense Forces 1st Convade Explosive Ordnance Disposal and Warship Battalion hosted this event. But where did this cooperation begin? What is the convention and Protocol 5 about? To understand this cooperative effort among diplomats, military experts, and thousands of professionals around the globe, we will visit the disarmament capital of the world, Geneva. The United Nations office in Geneva has for long decades served the disarmament process. The spirit of Geneva, the common will to reach consensus, is the key in this endeavor. Hundreds of diplomats and military experts from UN member states meet here regularly to negotiate and implement various disarmament and non-proliferation treaties. From the smallest informal consultations to large-scale public lectures, thousands of meetings are hosted by the United Nations office in Geneva every year. But regardless of the actual topics of these disarmament conferences, the participants know that while flowers are measuring the time in peaceful Geneva, time becomes a question of life or death for the victims on the battlefield or in hospitals. And now, let's have a look behind the scenes to reveal the hidden details. First of all, uh, what does it mean, explosive remnants of war? Uh, these are conventional munitions with explosive, uh, which fall under one of the uh, two categories. Uh, on the one hand, these are unexploded ordnance. That means uh, uh, conventional weapons which have been prepared for use. They have been used, but they have failed. They have not exploded for one reason or another. On the other hand, uh, the dynamics uh, uh, during conflict are such that a party or parties to a conflict may be forced to abandon their stocks of munitions. So these two categories, the abandoned munitions and the unexploded ordnance together, will remain on the battlefield. What is common is that they are dangerous. They are extremely dangerous and ready to kill. In 2000, uh, after the Kosovo conflict, we were able to document a year's worth of uh, effects on civilians of explosive remnants of war. In this case, uh, two-thirds of the dead and injured from explosions after the conflict were from explosive remnants of war, including about half cluster munitions, and another third were caused by uh, anti-personnel landmines. At that time, the ICRC in September 2000 called for uh, the regulation of in international law of all explosive remnants of war and also for new international rules uh, that would govern the use of cluster munitions to reduce their effects on civilian populations. So this was really the entry point of the ICRC to the whole question of explosive remnants of war. 
It was a, a matter of looking at decades of, of uh, this pattern of long-term suffering caused by uh, the weapons used even after they had no military purpose. To develop a new legal norm, states need a forum. This may be a permanent negotiating forum, like the Conference on Disarmament, or an ad hoc process. Uh, in the case of the explosive remnants of war, the states decided to make use of an existing uh, legal framework, which is the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, or CCW. Why? Simply because of the unique structure of this convention. It consists of a framework or umbrella convention and protocols uh, annexed to the convention. Each of these protocols regulates or prohibits the use of a specific weapon like uh, landmines or uh, incendiary weapons or uh, blinding laser weapons. So under the pressure of the uh, crisis associated with the uh, explosive remnants of war and uh, the initiative of the International Committee of the Red Cross as well as several countries, the states parties to this convention decided to establish a special structure within the process, a group of experts, to address the problem of explosive remnants of war. This group, which was established in 2001, for two years studied the different uh, aspects of the, of the problem, negotiated a new protocol, and this legal instrument was successfully adopted in 2003. Protocol 5 on explosive remnants of war to the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons entered into force in 2006. So what Protocol 5 does is say you can't any longer just walk away from the problem when you've, your military operations have created explosive remnants of war uh, on your territory or the territory of, of another country. After the introductory presentation, the Hungarian EOD experts demonstrated the devices they use in their daily work. The huge range of these devices clearly shows that field work requires broad training to successfully operate the specific tools, such as the heavy EOD robot. This job demands extra protection for the EOD experts, but no one in this business can forget the basic rules. Protective suits alone are not enough to save your life. Various methods of transportation are needed to get the job done and safely transport explosive remnants of war, even on public roads. Specially trained dogs help the EOD experts. Their training requires great attention and patience, but successful exercises reward trainers and dogs as well. In Hungary, many ERWs can be found in the Danube River. Removing them means an enormous challenge in a river where the underwater visibility is often less than 10 centimeters. Specialized vessels were created and customized to support this task. Even if a country is without a coastline, the ERWs in rivers and lakes may necessitate this capability as well. The implementation machinery of uh, the convention of a specific protocol is uh, uh, quite a complex exercise uh, with the involvement of uh, many professionals. Uh, usually we will have uh, uh, at least one president of the conference. This is, so to say, the political level, the political leadership of the conference. As the president of the conference, my job is, would be to move ahead on the, and build upon the work which has already been done in the past two conferences. Uh, the last two conferences of the Protocol 5 have taken important decisions with regard to universalization of Protocol 5 as well as strengthening implementation measures. Because of the uh, very technical sometimes character of the discussion, uh, there is often a need of a special person devoted a specific topic. These are the coordinators, uh, usually nominated and uh, approved by the uh, conference of the states parties, uh, who would lead the discussion on a specific topic. 
This work started two years ago when the first uh, uh, conference of state parties to the Protocol 5 decided to establish a meeting of experts to deal in a concrete manner with all aspects related to the implementation of Protocol 5. And we are working, uh, trying to, um, uh, to prevent as much as possible in uh, combat operations when a munition is used, uh, the misfunctioning of, uh, of munitions that could uh, lead a munition to become uh, an explosive element of war or an abandoned munitions. There is a very important uh, stipulation uh, in Article 4 that obliges states parties first of all to record the use of weapons, then to retain or keep this information and then to uh, mm, use this information for, for clearance and destroying of explosive remnants of war. In short, uh, states parties which have not yet uh, developed any system they should uh, develop such a system so that uh, at any moment they are able to, to record uh, the use of, of weapons. This is very important for clearance operations. Once the miners have uh, this information, they can in a safe uh, way uh, go to the area and clear uh, the affected, uh, affected uh, territories. Some of the core provisions of the protocol related to the state's obligations to clear and destroy the unexploded ordnance. Under these provisions, the states have agreed as soon as possible after the end of the conflict to take all necessary measures to protect civilians from the effects of ERW. They must, in particular, mark the ERW contaminated areas. They have to assess the threat posed by ERW and prioritize their needs. They have to find the necessary resources for clearance, funds, equipment, professionals. Well, when we refer to uh, victim assistance, we're referring to uh, providing for survivors of a certain weapon uh, the services, the help they need uh, to get over the ordeal that they've suffered. So this can involve giving them medical care, of course, if they need prosthetic limbs. But it can also involve much more than that, and we've come to understand now that it must involve much more than that. It can involve providing them psychological care. Importantly, it often involves helping them reintegrate into their community by giving them uh, economic assistance. A vocational training can be very important. So victim assistance basically refers to the assistance that we give to survivors of a uh, certain weapon system, and it's absolutely crucial. Unfortunately, a lot remains to be done in the area of victim assistance. Um, as we keep hearing from the survivors and affected states, a lot remains to be done in the implementation, even once the country does adopt all the legal instruments and the legal landscape is in place, meaning that all the major conventions for the rights of persons with disabilities, as well as conventions in the arms control area, are ratified. Still, the implementation is a big step away. This is where the affected country uses uh, the experience heard from other countries in a similar situation, possible cooperation between ourselves, and most importantly with donor states who can provide um, and match our needs. Participants began their second day in the training facility of the EOD unit. More than 1,600 unique devices serve the basic training for the upcoming EOD experts. The commander, Colonel Gabot Hoidu, introduces and explains the purpose of this room. Traditional training is supported by the latest 3D technology. Trainees can watch the inside operation of these ordinances on their computers. It's a, a, it's a very interesting display in here, particularly in the context of the whole of the CCW, um, because uh, of, of course this meeting, this workshop is to do with uh, Protocol 5, Explosive Remnants of War, of which you can see many, many examples of Explosive Remnants of War. But also uh, one of the protocols in the CCW, Protocol 3, deals with and bans uh, incendiary bombs. Uh, and here, 
uh, here. There are uh, a number of examples of the very incendiary bombs which led to that, uh, to that ban. And then also here, if you see hanging uh, here, is the, what is credited really as being the very first cluster bomb uh, uh, dropped on, uh, on um, uh, England during the Second World War. So you have the whole spectrum of uh, those items uh, uh, covered by the CCW in this room. So it's a very good, expansive collection. It's very important to keep in mind that, that uh, these explosive ordnance are uh, dangerous after so many years as well. Uh, and uh, it's very important to mention that it can be even more dangerous as uh, the time goes by uh, these uh, safety mechanisms be it in, inside these uh, ordnance can, uh, uh, can be worn and that's why uh, it can be more sensitive for any movement. It's a very, uh, it's a really a true thing uh, for hand grenades for example. As you can see in my hand uh, it's an uh, Italian type of hand grenade that we found under the rooftop of a, uh, of a high school uh, in Hungary. And uh, uh, it was very important to tell the, the children over there not to play with this because it's not, it's not looks like, it, it doesn't look like an uh, like a, a explosive ordnance. It just look, can look, uh, they can see it as a toy or something. But uh, we had to tell them that it's very important not to move or not to touch all of these uh, ordnance maybe for this maybe for this hand grenade can bow up even for the slightest move uh, what they make uh, with this one although it's uh, it's quite easy to take a, a, a purely uh, humanitarian perspective um, from from the, uh, the the problem that these items uh, afford on, on the ground but ultimately they start life and they're certainly used generally as a mil from a military uh, per perspective um, so uh, it, it's at the same time a humanitarian perspective and a disarmament perspective so it's important that uh, uh, that all concerned elements uh, are able to have a forum to to discuss things informally and formally uh, and hopefully come to to uh, mutually agreed solutions to deal with the prevailing problems on the ground Synergies for me is very much like connecting the dots, as has been used the phrase. It's, we have, if you look at the various dots out there, we have the CCW, we have the Mind Bank Treaty, we have the newly adopted Cluster Munitions Convention. See this as different dots and see how we can create an interlink between those three fora, between the three conventions, which do work in closely related fields. So it makes substantially, it makes sense that we work together, that we establish the synergies, use the synergies. Um, it makes sense also in terms of uh, financial interests because funding is necessary for all the activities we are carrying out. Um, in times of economic crisis, funding will not be limitless. To the contrary, funding is always with big and strong limits. So you need to make sure that the money is, that is there is uh, used in the best possible and most efficient manner. And for me, it makes therefore a lot of sense to try to establish a lot of synergies. So indeed, we have three important international treaties that deal with similar subjects. You have the Mine Ban Convention that bans anti-personal landmines. You have the Protocol on Explosive Remnants of War, which deals with all explosive remnants of war. And then you have the Cluster Munition Convention that prohibits the use of cluster munitions and also requires their clearance. So, yeah, you, we could say, why, how do these all fit together? Uh, and indeed, the way the ICRC describes this is that these are all international humanitarian law treaties, and they deal with weapons that can't stop killing. These three treaties, we believe, are entirely complementary, and it's important for states to adhere to all of them because the anti-personnel landmines problem won't be solved except by stopping the use, which is the, the uh, convention does. Also, the problem caused by cluster munitions will get worse and worse unless the, the, the weapon is not used, and that's what the Convention on Cluster Munitions uh, does. But, of course, there, there is not going to be a prohibition on all explosive weapons. There, there will be armed conflict, and then we have to address all other weapons that are used that may pose a threat to civilians after the conflict. 
And that's what the uh, protocol on explosive remnants of war does. It may be uh, uh, not as specific and uh, legally binding in some aspects as the other two conventions, but indeed it's very, very ambitious in that it, it addresses uh, such a broad category of weapons uh, used by our forces. In, in that way, you could say it's quite unprecedented. The CCW process, as you see, is a very important process for the international community as it strengthens the regulation of armed conflict as well as strengthen principles of international humanitarian law. Uh, there, there, there are various countries at various stages of development uh, which have to be brought together. Uh, anything which uh, is consensus-driven uh, has a, a legal validity has the support of the international community, and it helps in, 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 in moving the process forward. Uh, it goes without saying that if there is consensus, the results uh, will be very good. And therefore, consensus building is essential with regard to all disarmament uh, work in the CCW process. After the training center, the experts were transported to a nearby shooting range at Erdőkertesh. While at the previous day participants were mainly passive visitors, today this will change and they can use these tools. At the same time, just several hundred meters away, the EOD experts are preparing the demolition site. Several old ERWs are to be demolished today. Even a large 100 kilogram bomb will be destroyed. Demonstrating the various tools is just the beginning. Getting into the suit takes manpower. Using specialized boots reduces the risk of activating the ERWs on the contaminated ground. After identifying the exact location of an ERW in the ground, the EOD team uses flags to mark the sensitive area. A magnetic detector, supported by a GPS system, can provide a three-dimensional map of the site. Now it is time for some practice. In the meantime, the demolition site has been prepared. Participants visiting the site were given some extra protection. The old ERWs are positioned in the hole. Different types need different handling. After the participants left the site, the prepared ERWs were rigged and then buried. Everything is set up and ready to be detonated. A quick visit to the demolition site serves as the final portion of the workshop. The CCW sponsorship program is basically uh, a program that is meant to um, help with the uh, implementation and uh, universalization of uh, the CCW and its protocols. And it gives financial support to uh, countries and uh, individuals um, to participate in CCW-related activities. What we are trying to do is to get those countries uh, uh, that, for whatever reason, uh, are not yet participating in meetings or have not even joined um, the uh, CCW and the protocols um, as state parties to become aware of the existence, um, the importance of the, um, of the treaty and of the importance of actively participating in meetings. And if we can give a small contribution by uh, making it possible for those countries to send representatives to those meetings, um, we have already, we are serving our purpose because the purpose is um, to widen uh, the participation 
in the meetings and in the end, hopefully, um, to, um, to increase the, uh, the membership of the treaty as such. A convention may be uh, successful or not, and this depends on a number of different factors. Uh, of course, it depends first of all on the text of the convention and its provisions, uh, whether they are realistic and sufficiently far-reaching. But it depends also a lot on the states' parties, on their active involvement in the implementation of the convention, of its provisions. Uh, they are the real master of the process, those on whom the efficiency and the outcome of the process depends. The only way to have your voice heard uh, and to influence the process is to participate. We as secretariats stand ready to support and advise you in your endeavor.